Good afternoon, my name is Chrissy Matheson and I'll be your moderator for today's press briefing. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the Premier of Nova Scotia, Stephen McNeil, and Nova Scotia's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Robert Strang. Go ahead, uh, thank you, Christine. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Today we're reporting two new cases of COVID-19. One case is in, northern in the northern zone and is related to travel outside of the Atlantic bubble. The traveler is isolating as required. The other case is in the central zone and is currently under investigation. Since our briefing on Monday, there have been seven new cases and we currently have 19 active cases. As of today, online booking for COVID-19 tests is available at all primary assessment centres and the IWK. This will drastically reduce the amount of time it takes to get COVID tests and it means that you will get your results back sooner. The gargle test for children is now available at all primary testing centres across the province and we are continuing to build on our testing strategy and our capacity. Dr. Strang, over to you. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as the Premier said, as of today, we have 19 active cases of COVID-19 with two new cases being reported today. So to date, for, the, for those who look for the cumulative numbers, we've had 1,136 cases of COVID-19 in the province, 120,791 people tested with negative results and 65 deaths. Yesterday, Nova Scotia Health Authority's lab completed 1,260 tests. Uh, I am pleased to be able to say today that I'm feeling less anxious about the cluster uh, in Clayton Park that we announced on Monday. We've had no new cases in that cluster uh, or associated with the cluster uh, since Tuesday. Uh, and we've had good uptake on the testing as our, as our number uh, of, you know, that we sh uh, I just shared about the number of people tested shows. And I want, th I want to thank everybody who's come forward for testing. However, we're not out of the woods yet, and we will continue to monitor this cluster. Uh, but so far, things are looking better than they were earlier uh, this week. There's certainly nothing to suggest we have any uh, spread into the broader community. This is, however, this is what we expect and what we are planning for. That we were with COVID all around us in other parts of uh, Canada outside the Atlantic bubble and internationally, we are going to see uh, ongoing introductions of COVID into this province, uh, and that are uh, and are we are we we are planning for that and we expect to see that. Nova Scotians should uh, should be uh, have those expectations as well. But what we're planning for is this type of response based on uh, still still having clear restrictions at our border to limit the introduction, having rapid access to testing and public health capacity for follow-up, uh, and then having everybody following the public health measures. Because one of the things we are finding, even in this latest cluster, is that even though it wasn't perfect, in many of the situations, the public health measures were being followed, which limited the ability of the virus, even though there was in a, in a family, for instance, to get beyond that. So, uh, so I, I think it's important to, uh, to emphasize that these collective approaches that have kept us safe so far are what, what will continue to keep us safe and what will, what will allow us to uh, stay on top of and out front of the, uh, the fully expected continued introduction of COVID here into the province. Our whole goal is to, uh, is to uh, detect it early and prevent wide community spread. And, and we are still, uh, we're, still, we're still doing that with what we, what, the way we responded this last week. And so on Monday, we told you that the Nova Scotia Health Authority was putting plans in place uh, to help people in that, uh, that part of, of Halifax to access testing more, uh, more quickly and easily. And we, uh, we were put plans in place to stand up a temporary assessment centre at a vacant retail space in the Bears Lake Business Park. But as we've gone through the week and we came to the conclusion this morning that, that, that this actually is temporary, uh, the site is not actually needed. However, if that changes, then we can now respond quickly because uh, we have access to this site. And uh, uh, I've said it to many people this morning, I'll say it here publicly, I'd f it's much better in my mind to have some put plans in place and have something available uh, and then not actually need it than it is to actually have a need for something that we haven't planned for and then we're in a, in a crisis situation. So the right decisions were made, uh, knowing we might need it, but we're fortunately we're in a position where we can stand down from that, but we still have now capacity to this, to this space, uh, whether it's next week uh, or in the weeks ahead where we might need it. 
As the Premier said, the ability to book a COVID test online is now available across the province. Uh, the eastern uh, people in the eastern zone uh, got that ability uh, starting this morning. So now anyone who, uh, our, 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 our message is, is to all Nova Scotians, if they feel unwell, uh, go online and do the online assessment. And if you're judged to need testing, you can just, you'll automatically be directed to uh, an online booking site for the uh, uh, primary assessment centers that are closest to you. Uh, this, these important steps uh, are, will, are dramatically speeding up the process for both ass assessment and booking an appointment. Uh, and if people also follow, we're building more capacity in our assessment centers. We're br we brought, we have more lab capacity. And ultimately, if people put in their, give an email, we can give people their results by email. So the whole testing process has been uh, dramatically enhanced and, and sped up, which is, um, which to me is a really good news and shows how we're re how we're responsive and, and we're investing in the right places for our ongoing uh, COVID response. As we continue to see new cases in Nova Scotia, I think it's important to remind people uh, about the, the the COVID alert lap. Uh, sorry, the COVID alert app that is now out there that people can download. It's uh, that'll help them be aware if they may have been as exposed to COVID-19. If people have, they can go on on your phone, go to the app store. It's the federal as a COVID alert app. Uh, if you have it on your phone and if you come into close contact with somebody who has tested positive for COVID-19, you'll get a notification and directed uh, to further information about what your next steps will, will be. And the app is set up that uh, the alert is based on if there's close, if, uh, if two phones are in uh, close proximity, which is six feet or less for at least 15 minutes, then that it, then how, then the, the technology works that if somebody then tests positive and they put their their key in uh, of, of being a positive case, and that a notification alert goes out to all the phones that have met that criteria for that close contact. There'll be more than 5 million downloads across Canada, but uh, we have a population of 30, 30 plus million. So we have a lot of room uh, to, to grow. Uh, so I would encourage all Nova Scotians uh, to, uh, to uh, download that app. It's just one more tool that helps us up, uh, helps us in terms of people being aware that they might have been exposed uh, and, and what steps they need uh, to take next uh, in terms of our collective uh, fight against COVID. It, I'll remind people that, it, that uh, it, it does use Bluetooth to communicate, but no personal information is collected or shared or tracked through this, I, I, this app in, in, um, uh, in any way, shape, or form. So again, if you haven't downloaded the, the COVID app, I would encourage you to, to go do that. I'm going to move on to talk about uh, class, uh, further about the self-isolation that we uh, announced on Monday. Uh, as we said Monday, uh, that uh, that uh, as, as our cases continue to increase, usually associated with travel, we are asking people to avoid uh, any non-essential tra travel in and out of the Atlantic provinces. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about what essential travel is, uh, and essentially, we're, you know, we can't define that for you. But you need to ask yourself uh, uh, some questions about why you're traveling, how important it is, or why, why you're bringing somebody into the Atlantic bubble. And if there, if you're, if you can say, if the, if there's not a, a, a nest, if it's not necessary to do, we're asking that travel uh, to be deferred. And if you do go ahead with that tra travel, you have to be prepared for the requirement uh, of a 14-day quarantine for the whole house household that uh, th that will uh, result from that travel. Uh, so if people travel, when they arrive back in Nova Scotia, they, they will have to self-isolate uh, in a space that is, uh, that is self-contained. So whether it's uh, away from the home or, there, or where other people are living, uh, in a hotel, or if they stay in, that, in, a, in, in a household, they must be able to uh, completely isolate from everybody else in that house, household. Um, and the, really the issue is around having shared spaces and, and not being in the same space at the same time. So to allow, to allow this to happen, the, the traveler would have to have their own bathroom and bedroom uh, if they're uh, you know, being supported with food being delivered to them. Um, uh, so things like you know, an, an in-law suite or a basement suite uh, would work for that. But if people are thinking about how they need, they can do this in their house, they have to remember that it has to be, you know, uh, the 
the traveler has to be able to be kept completely separate from anybody else in the household. And the bottom line is where we need to take uh, additional steps to avoid the spread of COVID-19 from a traveler who now anybody traveling outside the bubble with the levels of COVID activity we're seeing in other parts of the country are certainly at a significantly increased risk of being exposed and bringing COVID with them into the province. And then we have to make sure one of the key steps is making sure that they're they're quarantining in a way that doesn't put unnecessary risk to Nova Scotian residents here who then will go out into our communities and potentially expose other, other kinds of people. I recognize this is hard for folks uh, and we know the impact of what we're doing, but the reality is, is that, uh, that uh, we have to continue to make sure that we uh, take the appropriate steps to minimize the introduction of COVID into the province and minimize the chance of it having, uh, having broader spread. We've also had a lot of questions about uh, workers who are exempted from the quarantine under, the, under our public health order or workers on a rotational uh, schedule. Uh, if you're an exempted worker, and uh, exe uh, like somebody is a member of the military, uh, and they don't have to do the 14-day quarantine uh, if they're being tra if they're traveling for work-related reasons, they that person themselves will continue to be exempt uh, as long as their travel remains work-related, uh, and and uh, the rest of the household um, uh, is exempted from uh, from the household quarantine as long as none of them have traveled for non-essential reasons as well. And the same with rotational workers. The rotational workers have a modified self-isolation um, and, and, and that they're allowed to come uh, and they're, they're allowed to be out, in, out, out, of, out of their home or their property within, but within their household bubble. Um, and uh, the same requirements, so the rest of their household, uh, the rules for the quarantining of the whole, whole household doesn't apply for family members of, of rotational workers. They all have to, the, as long as that rotational worker uh, sticks with it, it has to, you know, they can travel about with their household, but uh, on, on a limited basis. And our definition of rotational workers are people who have to work elsewhere in Canada uh, outside of the bubble on a set schedule that they travel back and forth uh, up to uh, a, a maximum of four weeks on, four weeks off. If they are, um, if their periods at home are longer than four weeks, they are not considered rotational because we believe that then they have enough time to have a stricter quarantine and still have sufficient time to be here uh, with their family. And so they're, they're not eligible for the modified self-isolation. We get a lot of tests on that. We are working on a testing strategy for rotational workers in particular, uh, similar to what is in place uh, in, in Newfoundland. So we're, we're, we're actively working on that and bring, be bringing that forward in, in, uh, um, very soon. Um, the, the use of testing, I'm just going to talk about testing for a minute. The use of testing for a specific group of travelers like rotational workers uh, is reasonable and makes sense. Uh, but we're getting a lot of questions about why aren't we traveling, every, why aren't we testing everybody at, at the airport, everybody at the border entry. We've looked at this and certainly testing all the entrance in a land, uh, the, all of the entrance to, uh, to Nova Scotia. Uh, as I said, as, as some groups are suggesting in that, is really not feasible or realistic uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, but most importantly, it's people are, who are asking for this are perhaps not understanding the limitations of, of the, of the one-time uh, rapid testing that we have. Um, that it would not allow us to uh, process the large numbers of people and give accurate enough results. So ultimately, this type of testing wouldn't allow us to uh, remove the quarantine period. Uh, where it's most appropriate to think about using these rapid testing is in very focused, targeted populations like the rotational workers, uh, where we have where we can use it to modify quarantine, but not completely remove a, a quarantine. Let me finish off by, by really just some reflections of where, we, where we're going and what we need everybody to focus on. Um, as I've said previously, and I can't say it too many times, that our collective fate as it re relates to COVID is very much in our own hands. If you look at what's happening across the country with, with case numbers continue to increase, um, that is very concerning and it's a situation that we need to 
do everything we can to avoid uh, ending up in that situation here, uh, anywhere in Atlantic Canada. Uh, and our focus is, of course, is in Nova Scotia. So there are things that we need to continue to focus on to keep ourselves COVID safe uh, right here in this province. Uh, and I, and I, I keep coming back to that the concerns around people are getting tired, people are feeling that we, we've been at this for nine months, that uh, I'm not at risk for COVID. And that we really need to ask people, people need to think differently, that yes, this is a long road, but we have a long road to go. Uh, and all the things we're doing, it's not about yourself. Many people aren't themselves at, at high risk of getting severely ill for, for COVID, but everybody is at some risk. But what's more important is that everything we do uh, has an impact on how much we're putting other people at risk in our communities, how much we're putting uh, our, our seniors in our communities at risk. There are many people in our social circles that don't, we may not even know, have an underlying health condition that puts them at risk. If we're not careful, we're putting them at risk. We're putting our healthcare workers at risk and our health system at risk. And those healthcare workers have shown up every day for the last nine months and well before COVID, ready to look after us no matter what we have. And it's, it, to me, it's, we need to understand that if we are complacent, we're putting other, ourselves at risk, we're putting those healthcare workers at risk and who knows when we're gonna need them, whether it's for COVID or some other kind of uh, healthcare event that we have. So we need to think about each other and how we're collectively going to do the things that's necessary to keep our, our, our community safe. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, nationally, and if you look at what's coming from the federal government, where they talk about decreasing the number of contacts we have. In other provinces, if you've seen the modeling projection from the federal governments, they say that how we get to uh, other provinces, how they get to uh, flatten their curve in the second wave is by greatly decreasing the number of contacts. And what that that means that all of us need to think about how many people are, are we in contact with throughout our day, whether it's our family, going to work, going to school, etc. And what do we need to do here in Nova Scotia? It's not about flattening the curve, but it's actually being out in front of the curve so we don't have to flatten it. It's keeping our situation. It's a preventive measure for us. So it, everything we're doing is all about getting out and starting to think now, it's the middle of November. We've got really to think about in the past new year, how are we going to do in the next six to eight weeks to minimize our social contacts, decrease the number of people that we are in contact with, keep our social groups small, keep our social activities limited and in safe ways. And when we're in places where we need to use masks, wear your mask and wear it properly. If you're not feeling well, just stay home. It's those simple steps, but it all comes back to if we're, if, we're, if we're limiting who we're in contact with, the virus is spread by person to person and in shared close air spaces. So if we're careful about who we're in contact with, we're careful about uh, the type of social situations that don't put us in, in risky situations where there's a chance for spread between large numbers of people, that's all, that, that, those are the things that we need to focus on to keep ourselves safe. So if we understand how the virus is spread, we understand how what we can do, we're really to minimize the spread of virus through hand washing, through masking, and minimizing, really focusing on how many people are going to be in our social circles for the next six to eight weeks. If we focus on that, we will, we will, we will put ourselves in the best position for even though COVID comes, it's not going to have a chance to get a, a strong foothold in our communities. So we're going to keep coming back to this message, but I thought it was important for people to really remind yourself if there's one thing to concentrate on, it's think about how many people am I in contact with today? And how, what am I going to do to reduce the number of people that I don't necessarily have to come into close contact with? Premier, back to you. Thank you, Dr. String. And Chrissy will now answer any questions. Reminder, one question and one follow-up in the amount of time that we have today for reporters in the room and on the phone. First, we'll start with Danielle Edwards with the Canadian Press. Um, I think this question would be best directed to Dr. Strang, but um, what's the messaging for people who are traveling outside of the province uh, for the holidays? I know, especially since there are so many students uh, in the province. Um, I know this kind of came up for Thanksgiving. I just want to ask if uh, that would be considered essential travel to go see family. 
So we know if there are students studying here and they're going somewhere else outside of the bubble for, for Christmas holidays and coming back, they are going to have to do undergo a, a 14-day quarantine period. That's been communicated to them very clearly by our post-secondary institutions. And we're working with, uh, with our, with our uh, educational colleagues around how, how do we support them in, in various ways around that quarantine like we did in August and September. For families that have students that are studying outside of the bubble that might be thinking about coming home uh, for the holidays, uh, as tough as it is to say, uh, the best choice would be for them to actually stay where they're at. Now, I recognize that's not going to be possible for everybody, but right now, if they come back, you're going to have to think about the implications of that for the, house, for the household. We are looking at some ways that we may make, some, uh, make it clearer in terms of what can be done within a household. Uh, some clear direction so people could be in the house but following a very strict protocol that would allow that um, but right now we you know we, they, they, there are implications of pe bringing somebody from outside of the Atlantic Canada home for the holidays and we need to be very careful about how we do that and I know that's a tough message to deliver but it's about our collective well-being uh, and that we need to think about everybody in Nova Scotia together and what we do collectively to minimize our, our, our overall risk. Can I have your follow-up? Um, I'd also like to ask about the uh, Clayton Park cluster because um, I think it was said that uh, either earlier this week or late last week that there were nine cases involved. Has that number changed or...? Yeah, we had a total of 11, but there's been no cases, in, no new cases in there since Tuesday. So what we've done is 11, but as we've done more testing, both we've had people come forward, you know, that we, we had a number of community exposure sites. We've had a number of contacts. Everybody's been negative there. We've tested more people within the com within the community that's that are directly linked uh, with the cases. And and as I said, we've had two more cases, but we have a lot of people testing negative as well. So it it the the that's why it's making what I said. I'm less anxious. It's it's kind of stabilized and plateaued. We're not out of it yet. We still have to watch and test and 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 keep an eye on people who may have been exposed. But certainly, I'm less anxious and less less concerned that there's the potential for broad community spread from this cluster today than I was on the weekend and Monday. Next question will go to Mike Gorman with CBC. Dr. Strang, you're talking about the importance of limiting contacts, particularly over the next six to eight weeks. And of course, the next six to eight weeks are basically Christmas season. What, what kind of messaging is public health putting out both to uh, shopping centers and the stores in them and to the general public about how they ought to be approaching um, uh, Christmas shopping. So we're, we're going to be putting out some clear guidance uh, in the next week or so around Christmas in more detail. We've also ha started some, some conversations uh, with the kind of business and uh, sectors, including the retail sector, about this. Uh, and I was on a call today where I reminded folks that, uh, that we have clear uh, numbers around how people can get together, uh, gathering limits. And there's clear direction for how businesses can operate but within the public health requirements of keeping people physically distanced. And if they can't keep them physically distanced, they have a, can have a maximum number of people in their business. Malls are going to have to figure out with the increasing number of people how they manage uh, the flow of people to make sure that people outside of you know, close group, household groups of no more than 10 are actually kept separate. It's their responsibility to figure, you know, to figure out how they run their business or their operation, but stick within the public health rules. We'll support them, and uh, I'm doing a lot of, you know, business sector consultations over the next few weeks to help them understand and answer questions. We have already, uh, I was on a discussion yesterday about our, our the government enforcement folks about putting together an enforcement compliance strategy over the coming weeks. So, so the various inspectors that we have are out there, always starting with an educative approach, but we're out there with a compliance, a strong compliance uh, kind of reach out from uh, government uh, in these various kind of uh, places as well. I just want to apologize. I'm, I'm hearing that we're having a bit of a technical glitch with our captions on the live stream. And so I want to apologize. Um, we are working on it, but if you're not seeing captions, um, we just want to apologize in advance that we are working on that technical glitch. Next question will go to okay, Samantha. Can I, can, I, can I finish that answer too? Yes. But ultimately, this is the responsibility of Nova Scotians. If you're going into a mall, what are you doing to make sure that you're keeping physically distanced? 
What are you doing to make sure that unless you have a valid reason to not wear a mask, you're wearing a mask and wearing it properly? So I don't want to, I don't want to, my answer, I don't want to have all the responsibility all land on the business operator or the mall operator. There's equal responsibility for Nova Scotians to take responsibility for their own actions, even as they go about shopping or whatever for the holidays. Um, Premier, it was just announced not long ago that you're, you're you're going to prorogue uh, the House next month. As you've rightly pointed out, uh, you wrapped the spring sitting before COVID arrived here, and since then, obviously, we, kn we know what's happened here. Why do you think it's appropriate to not have some form of a fall sitting where the government's response to COVID can be formally debated on the floor of the legislature? Well, the, the requirement to have a fall session will be met uh, on December 18th when we go into prorogue the House. Uh, and uh, each and every day, really, uh, when it comes to the issue of COVID, I've been before the people of Nova Scotia. Uh, the reality of it is we're selecting a new premier uh, in the process. Uh, that will happen in the early months of February. Uh, it made no sense that we would go in and pass legislation, create a path uh, around policy. Uh, where I would then be handing it over to a new premier. They will have their opportunity to set their own mark on their government, uh, and they'll do that in the spring. Next question will go to Samantha Long with All Nova Scotia. So, Mr. Strang, I'm hearing that there is a nursing home in Windsor that has cancelled all activities to what, to what they describe as potential community spread. Uh, is that related to any of today's new cases? I'm not aware of that circumstance. Um, I'm not aware of anything that would suggest we have community spread in, in that in that part of the province. So I, uh, I can't comment any further. But uh, we would encourage, other than to say that we continue to work with long-term care sectors, on on being as open as safely possible, may, in knowing that activities for residents, visits from family, etc., are all very important to the overall health of the residents, and we will only restrict those uh, if, if and when it's necessary from a COVID perspective. So um, I would encourage all the facilities to be in, in as open as possible. We still have low levels of COVID across the province. Uh, and then while we have to be cautious, we also need to understand uh, uh, and look at the overall health for the long-term care residents as well. Premier, um, so just a question about proroguing the House. Your party is set to choose a new Premier on February 6th. How can you commit the next Premier to open the session on any particular day? Well, in order to prorogue the House, you have to have a date coming back, uh, but the, the new Premier will determine uh, the path for themselves. So uh, we've set uh, February 16th uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, when the Premier, the new Premier is chosen, uh, they will work with the Lieutenant Governor uh, on the exact time and opening of that session. But in order to prorogue the House, I had to give an indication to the House uh, when it would be called back. Next question will go to Nabal Snan with the Herald. On Monday, you said that you've made changes so that people without health insurance can get a COVID test at no cost. I was just wondering if you could speak more about that and uh, how has this been a barrier so far? So it, it was an issue for, we, it came up most commonly for uh, international students who may not have uh, health insurance that would allow them to, uh, you know, receive health care. And we wanted to make sure that, and we've, we've had to deal with that in a few of our cases over the last few weeks. So we wanted to make sure that, that uh, finances uh, weren't a barrier to getting people to come forward for, for COVID testing. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's as straightforward as that. We we don't want to miss a case simply because somebody was reluctant to come forward because they were concerned about how they're going to pay for it. Nabal, will have your follow-up. Um, so we also talked about how businesses should continue contact tracing. I mean, like taking people's uh, contact information. Um, I was just wondering, are they liable if they fail to provide that information when public health health asks for it? So I haven't delved into the legalities around that. We certainly ask all various businesses to keep registries. We've had conversations with the restaurant sector recently that uh, strengthen uh, their their work around this. They were one of the first to develop their plan back in the spring, and and uh, it, it 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 wasn't necessarily as strong as we would have would like now in terms of what the restaurant sector is saying to individual restaurants about keeping a a, a log of registry. Uh, lo sorry, a log of customers. So they're strengthening that, uh, knowing that that works for sit-down restaurants, you know, uh, other places. We don't we don't expect.
places where there's many people coming in, you know, uh, in and out very quickly, like grocery stores, like takeout restaurants, etc. We, we don't expect them to keep a log, but in businesses where where it's able to do it, and 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 then people have to register in some way, where we're we're expecting that they're going to do that, because uh, having that information, if there is a case in their business, makes is is a, is very helpful for public health to speed up our contact tracing. Um, as I said, it's not a requirement legally under the under the under the Health Protection Act. Uh, so uh, you know we haven't had any problems of, of people not doing it. It's just we we're working as particularly with the restaurant sector to make sure they were very clear on what was what was what we were asking them to do. Next question will go to Natasha Pace with CTV. Um, can you tell us how many in total how many cases are still under investigation and what's taking so long to to complete those? Well, we have the 19 active cases. Uh, I don't have the breakdown of how many are under investigation. I think it's fair to say that uh, we're still uh, on the on the on the group of cases in Clayton Park. We we're still looking at those to try to uh, ultimately have an understanding of are there other people that may have been exposed, and also what was the ultimate cause or source from that from from that cluster. We're, we're so we're investigating that whole cluster still and of course our newer cases uh, that we've just been aware of today are still under active investigation. So all the other ones are really, as I said at our briefing on Monday, that the two uh, clusters that we talked about a week ago Monday, they've all been kind of wrapped up. So it's really the, the, the group of cases together in Clayton Park where uh, I would say that they're still under collective active investigation and our newest cases today that were announced that were under active investigation, of course. Um, there were 1,260 tests processed yesterday, which is obviously below what our capacity is. I'm wondering why it's still taking so long for people to get the results. It's taking 72 hours or longer for people to hear back. Um, do we need more staff? Like, what is the, the issue mm -hmm. there? So there were some challenges management was brought to me. I don't know the details, but it was identified as some of the, it was really technological challenges uh, a week or so ago that that resulted in some unfortunate delays in people, especially getting their negative results back when they'd signed up to get them by email. My understanding uh, earlier this week was that all those issues have been resolved, so we shouldn't be having those delays as we move forward. Next question. Our goal is to have 48 a maximum 72-hour turnaround for tests. And by and large, the vast majority were meeting that target. Next question, we'll go to Tim Biscay with the Halifax Examiner. Dr. Stringer, I, excuse me, I only just now got the email from Public Health. Um, I've been asking for a day and a half about the, if there was an exemption given to the Canadian National Short Track Team, and they say there was. Um, did you give that exemption before they got here? So uh, an exemption is the wrong answer. So I have been I w I've been working with the short with the national organization and Sports Center Atlantic uh, for several weeks prior to them coming here, and making sure that they have, they've developed a comprehensive protocol that keeps those individuals in quarantine. They are staying at a local hotel. The only time they leave the hotel or leave the floor of their hotel is to be transported to a local rink, and and, and do their training. While they're in training, they're at a separate part of a, it's a multi-rink complex. They're, they're, they're absolutely quarantined while they do their training. Uh, they're in no close contact with anybody else. So they've actually had uh, maintained their quarantine with some modifications to allow these elite, elite uh, these allows these elite athletes to do their training while still under very tight protocols. Um, we did the same with canoe kayaking in the summer. When I talked with the Sports Center Atlantic, Nova Scotia, because of our safe safety, is seen as a, a as a, an optimal place for these elite athlete groups to come and and train while maintaining strict protocols which uh, which keep them in a modified quarantine and doesn't create any additional risk to Nova Scotians and quite frankly uh, provide some small economic boost to some of our hotels who are who are doing these uh, functioning as these, as these quarantine hotels to me it's a very good news story why not um, just make those uh, arrangements public record as, as they happen uh, we're not we're not hiding it from the public, you're the first person to ask. Next question will go to Elizabeth McSheffrey with Global. Uh, just on the 
subject of proroguing the legislature. Um, you know, I'm sure there were lots of politicians, elected officials, members of the public that were looking forward to question period, seeing the robust debate in action uh, in the House. Uh, what do you say to those people who won't have that opportunity now? I would say to them uh, uh, that I, my number one focus will be to deal with the issue of COVID. Uh, it is here, it is around us, and I will stay committed and focused on that. As I said in April when I made the announcement that I was stepping down, that I would be here to support uh, Dr. Strang Public Health and to work with Nova Scotians to find our way through the second wave. Uh, most Nova Scotians would understand uh, that we are selecting a new Premier now and it would be inappropriate for me uh, to go set a policy path for them. They will determine that when they get elected uh, and they'll do that in the new year. I guess I would just ask then, what if people wanted to challenge you specifically on the response to the pandemic? Um, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's different when you, you know, host press conferences and send out a message and tell Nova Scotians what you've already done versus them, you know, through the legislature having the opportunity to have those questions asked by their elected officials. People challenge me every day, on, on not only on COVID, on every decision that I make. I've been out three times this week communicating to Nova Scotians. Uh, I am grateful for the kind response Nova Scotians have shown me uh, since my announcement in, in August and even before as we dealt with some of the uh, challenges that this province, unprecedented challenges this province has faced. Uh, but I made a decision it was time for me to move on uh, to a new path and we are selecting a Premier. They will put their own stamp on the government but I assured you and I will reassure you that I am committed to staying here and dealing with the issue of COVID and finding and helping Dr. Strang and public health find our way through this this winter. Next question will go to Francois Pierre Devoe with Radio Canada. Even though there will not be a fall sitting of the uh, legislature the, uh, this year, uh, is your government still planning on releasing a fall economic update like we've seen in many other provinces and the federal government? Just to know where the province finances are at after uh, nine months of uh, pandemic. Uh, yeah, this is my seventh year as Premier. Uh, I'm very proud of the record we had uh, delivering uh, fiscal health and stability back to this province. And every year we've delivered quarterly updates and this year will be no different. Uh, the Minister of Finance will, uh, uh, will communicate uh, that to Nova Scotians uh, uh, in this quarter. Go ahead with your follow-up. The uh, follow-up would be for Dr. Strang. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if you have more details about the, the case that was announced today that is under investigation. Uh, why is this case under investigation? Why, uh, why, why would, uh, what's, the, what's the reason why uh, this case is uh, maybe suspicious to you? The fact that we're saying it's under investigation is not suspicious. Simply the person tested positive and, and public health was alerted in the last 24 hours. So we need time to contact the person and do our work. That's all that under investigation means. Next question will go to Steve Gao with News 95.7. Good morning. A uh, quick question, Dr. Strang. Um, you reminded people already this morning about the COVID alert app, but uh, and I think it's been available for about a month now. I'm just curious um, how people, how you found people have been responding to it, and uh, does it factor in the rise of number of notifications that we've seen lately in potential exposure spread? So we don't have numbers. The federal government announced numbers recently, you know, as I said, 5 million uh, uh, Canadians. That's not broken down by province. So we don't have an, uh, uh, any breakdown of how many Nova Scotians have that. But clearly, if we factor in, you know, 5 million in our percentage, there's probably lots of room for, for growth here of people in Nova Scotia using the app. Um, uh, I'm not sure that your second part of the question, other than to say that as we get more COVID and there's more COVID in the country, uh, for sure there's probably going to be more people uh, that are alerted about a possible exposure. Uh, remember that the app is simply about uh, letting people know they might have been exposed uh, and we're directing them then if they do get alerted is they're encouraging them to be even more vigilant about monitoring their health and if they're unwell in any way uh, to 
do the online self-assessment and then follow the directions whether they need testing or not. It's simply another piece that I think it helps keep for people to keep COVID at the forefront of their minds and will be another reminder about their possibly being exposed uh, and, and what actions they need to take. Um, but it's it's it, it's it's just one tool of a, of, of a multi to multi layered approach that we have to take around COVID. Go ahead with your follow up, Steve. Uh, this week we've seen uh, outbreaks in long term care homes in Ontario and Manitoba. Surprisingly enough, um, how confident are you that the province Nova Scotia has measures in place to control any possible uh, outbreaks as cases begin to climb? So we continue to have uh, work with our continuing care sector to have very uh, clear uh, guidance around uh, for long-term care facilities. Uh, the staff screening, for instance, we're working at bringing in uh, periodic testing of staff. Uh, with federal restart money, we've substantively invested around infection control supports for long-term care facilities. We now actually have uh, have a have a uh, one of my colleagues, an infectious disease physician. Whose, whose role is now is supporting uh, long-term care facilities around the province with her expertise around infection control. So we've, we've significantly enhanced uh, that, that part of our work with the, with the continuing care sector. Um, but I keep coming back to, that we, if we, despite all the things we have in place, the way we keep our long-term care sector safe is by having our community safe with low, low levels of COVID activity. So, so we can do everything we can in the healthcare system, but again, what are, what are we gonna collectively do as Nova Scotians, uh, understanding that the actions that we take and the choices that we make uh, will, will have an impact on, on whether our long-term care facilities remain safe or not. Next question, we'll go to CBC Jean Laroche. Good afternoon, Premier. You announced your resignation, as you mentioned, three months ago. I wondered why uh, then you waited to announce prorogation now and not then. If this was your plan, as you said, it would be inappropriate to set a policy path for your successor. Well, we were following. Uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen with COVID uh, or necessarily need whether we had to go to the House for a policy position that needed to be, we would need the, the authority of the legislature to do. We, we don't. Uh, very proud of the work that's been happening uh, with, within the province. Uh, we've continued to, to do the work of government and we'll continue to do so. Uh, and I look forward to the new Premier uh, putting their own stamp on, on their government and laying that out for the people of Nova Scotia. Go ahead with your follow-up, Sean. Premier, as my colleagues have uh, already noted, there's a difference between a tightly controlled news conference and debate in the House. I wondered why you felt, uh, why you feel that elected representatives have no right to question you or your government directly over the decisions you've made since last March, and why you feel it is fair to leave your successor to answer those questions about what you and your government have done. I don't know if my successor will have to answer any questions about uh, what I've done. They'll be looking forward. Uh, I'm very proud of my record uh, as the Premier of this province. I'm grateful for the support I've received from Nova Scotians uh, and the kindness I've received from them uh, and, quite frankly, the thanks. Uh, and, and I want to thank them. Uh, this has been a tremendous journey. It's been the, uh, the highlight of my professional career to be the Premier of this province. Uh, and I made a commitment to them in August uh, that I was going to stay committed and focused to COVID and I was going to continue to do that alongside public health and that's exactly what I'm going to do as we are in the process now as a province. Uh, there's a new leader being chosen for the Liberal Party who will become uh, the next Premier and they will set the course on, on and the future of their government uh, and I look forward to uh, watching them do that. We'll go to Alicia Drous with Global. Thank you. I just actually want to reiterate what Jean was just asking because you didn't actually answer. Why do you feel that elected representatives don't have a right to ask you questions on your government's response to COVID? I, I, I didn't agree with the presumption of his question. Because I'm not sitting on the floor of the legislature doesn't mean they haven't been asking questions. We've had committees back and going. Uh, there's been committees going forward. They have a right to put forward any uh, any questions they may want to ask about uh, whether it's the pandemic or any other issue facing our province. Uh, but again, I am going to stay committed and focus, as I told Nova Scotians I would, on the issue of COVID. Go ahead with your follow-up, Alicia. Uh, yeah, this question is for Dr. Strang. I'm just wondering about the case that's under investigation um, that was announced today. I know that you said that it's under investigation because public health still needs to reach out to them and, and understand what happened. 
But if that's the case, I'm just wondering how we can be certain that it's not linked to the Clayton Park cluster at this point. So the preliminary information we would have, it's not just what we know about the, the, the early information, that it's, that it's not. Uh, but again, uh, you know, I, 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 it takes a bit of time to do our work. You know, we get, we get a positive case. As soon as we get that positive case, it's notified to public health electronically. We reach out and try to contact that, infor, in, that individual. Uh, and as soon as we're able to make contact, then we start our interviewing in terms of to understand where that person have been, has been, where they might have been infected, also who they might have might have infected. That's all part of the. And so, uh, you know, this morning when that case was reported, the public health was starting to do that work. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it's every case we have starts out as a case under investigation. And that's all the time that we have questions for. Oh, no, we have uh, one follow-up for a Nope, that's right. Sorry, I'm off my game today. That's all the time we have for questions today. <laughs> the technical. As Dr. Strang said, we we're hopeful that the Clayton Park cluster has been contained. But at the rate this virus moves, if we let our guard down, we could easily see another spike. I was on the phone with my colleagues, the premiers across the country last night, and a number of them talked about the difficult situations in their province as they watch the numbers of cases continue to climb. And I feel for them and their residents and citizens of the respective provinces. But I am very proud of our province and how hard everyone is working to follow the protocols. And I want to thank those who followed the potential exposure advisories and went to get tested. Our collective response is working. But I am still concerned. COVID is still here, and it's not going away anytime soon. We don't want a small number of cases to turn into a major outbreak. COVID is and has been relentless, and it will take over a community if we let it. Just look around the country at the record number of cases in some provinces. I don't want that for us, and I know these 14-day isolation isn't easy, but it is working. We had a cluster, and as I said, it appears that we have it contained. When we have another one, not if, but when we have another one, we need to be ready, because we are following the protocols. We can't let up now. I want to thank everyone for their cooperation and continued support and caring for each other, and I hope you have a great weekend.